Uh, I want to talk to you about tracheostomy emergencies today. Uh, actually, maybe it's less of a want and more of a have to. I think this is something that doesn't get covered very often, kind of at all, um, and that is real scary for most of us in the pre-hospital setting because we don't deal with these things very often. We're not super comfortable with them. We swore to know what they do, but we don't like know a lot of what they do. Uh, and really, when these things go bad, it's really kind of an important thing, and they go bad in a big way um, and can be uh, can be really devastating if you don't get it taken care of quickly. The um, thing about tracheostomies is they are a really good airway. Like the big problem that most of us think of, ABC, airway breathing circulation, once you have a tracheostomy, that airway is pretty well taken care of, uh, and you don't have to do a whole lot else with it uh, until it stops working. And then you got to do something else with it, and you got to do something else with it kind of fast. So you have to be a little bit facile with how you actually would take care of these things um, and what they do, what the little pieces do, uh, and how to have an algorithm so that if you run into the person who's in respiratory distress who has this critical airway need, uh, you'll be able to take care of it. I am pretty fond of this saying, and, and I use it fairly often, uh, but I think for tracheostomies, this is... Uh, particularly apt, uh, meaning that we don't have to get everything as perfect as it looked when the patient came out of the operating room or when they left the hospital even. Uh, all we really need to do is get somebody to breathe. So if we can get the person, you know, marginally there, we don't have to feel in the pre-hospital setting or in the, even in the ED setting that we've got to get this like completely tuned up and everything working perfectly. Uh, we just need to get them sort of alive and get them to the people that can take care of it on a longer scale or on a larger basis. That said, we have to know how to take care of these things because breathing's pretty important. And, you know, oxygenation, ventilation, all that kind of stuff, uh, that's kind of, a, kind of a critical thing you need to live. So uh, while the enemy of good is perfect, we don't have to have these guys 100%. We have to know how to get them from not functional to partially functional at least and temporize the situation until we can get to somebody else who has a better idea of what's going on. So when you're dealing with a tracheostomy emergency, you roll up on somebody's house and you find out they have a trach, uh, one of the big questions is, is the person breathing? So a lot of times we see the trach and we immediately go to like, oh crap, there's that thing. But we don't necessarily uh, have to all the time. If the person's breathing okay and it's not a respiratory issue, then the trach is of very little consequence otherwise. Or if the patient's in cardiac arrest, then the first thing we're probably thinking is, yes, we have to manage this airway, uh, we have to deal with this thing, but we've got to do some other stuff too, uh, like start CPR. So is the patient breathing? And that seems like a silly question, but it can be very difficult. And folks that have uh, a trach, it can be really tough to actually tell just from looking at them if they are breathing or if they're breathing normally or if they're breathing effectively. So um, what's the best way to probably know? Well, one of the easiest things we can do if there's any question at all is put capnography on the patient. So go ahead and put end tidal CO2 on them. And if they're exchanging gas, uh, <clears throat> then we know we've at least got part of the problem nailed down. Entitled capnography uh, is, uh, is super helpful in these folks to determine if there's any question about whether or not gas is actually being exchanged through that trach tube itself. And most of the time there will be a tube at least to start off with. Um, if you don't have a waveform and the patient doesn't look to be breathing, then you've got to uh, do some things real quick uh, or possibly check to see if they have a pulse because the patient may need CPR in that point. So once you, once you figured out the patient does have some respiratory effort uh, and is attempting to breathe, the next thing we want to do if they're in distress, if, if their sat is low, if they look like they're having a hard time breathing, is go ahead and provide them oxygen. And for somebody with a tracheostomy, you're going to show up and immediately think, okay, tracheostomy, tracheostomy, tracheostomy. But what you actually should be thinking is let's put oxygen on all the potential pathways into the trachea because it may not be entirely clear what the patient's anatomy is to start off with. So you show up, it's a pretty good bet that you should probably go ahead and put oxygen on <clears throat> both the stoma and from above. Now why is that? But don't they have a tracheostomy? Because they can't breathe, why are we putting oxygen on the face? Here's the thing. When you look at most people that you're going to see at home, um, by, probably by far they're going to have a tracheostomy meaning there is still a connection between the, <clears throat> excuse me, between the trachea and the oropharynx uh, via the larynx. 
they have a tube in place to sort of shortcut that because maybe there's some obstruction up here or maybe they uh, can't keep secretions out of it or something like that. But for the most part, most people that you're going to see are probably going to have this connection here. And that can be used to our advantage because you don't have to have a whole lot of connection. Uh, it doesn't have to be a very big space to get a little bit of air or oxygen from here down into the trachea itself. Uh, so you can use this to supplement the patient if they need oxygen, as well as over their trach tube themselves. Now, uh, the other situation that you may run into is the case of a laryngectomy. So that was a tracheostomy, but an intact larynx. Uh, a laryngectomy itself uh, removes the connection between the pharynx and the trachea. So the glottis is essentially completely gone, and what they've done is taken the trachea, the top of the trachea, and um, turned it outward so that there is no connection between the upper airway and the lower airway, really. Um, these people, you could put oxygen on their face all you want, and for the most part, it's not going to benefit them very much. Um, but if you put oxygen down here, this should be a patent airway. Uh, this is their only airway at this point. You don't have any other option. But in the beginning, it may be difficult to tell whether the patient's got a laryngectomy or whether they've got a tracheostomy. The family may be able to tell you one thing or the other, um, or they may not know. Or the patient may be there by himself and can't tell you at all. Either way, the patient's in respiratory distress. Uh, <clears throat> it's probably a solid bet to go ahead and put oxygen on any place where there might be a chance that you can get more oxygen down in there. And if that works, great. Now the next question, a lot of times that may not work, but if it does, if the patient's oxygenation comes up and they're breathing better, then cool. The next thing I would sort of ask is, is the tube patent? Meaning, do they have a patent airway? Do they have a patent tracheostomy? We know that this up here, for whatever reason, may not be uh, ideal or patent itself, although it might actually be more patent than we think. But at the moment, we're trying to decide whether or not this tracheostomy uh, tube is patent, uh, assuming there's a tube in place. You have to know what the tubes look like in order to uh, figure out what's going on otherwise, at least a little bit. You don't have to know all of them. Uh, but here's the, a couple of standard designs of tubes. They come in uh, this one up here, which is the standard uh, cuff tube with an inner cannula. Um, <clears throat> there are some that have uh, balloons, some that are uncuffed, some that have these little fenestrations, these uh, holes in the top of them, some that are uncuffed entirely and are just a tube, and then these little pediatric ones that... Um, not only are uncuffed, but also don't have an inner cannula in them. And these are all used for different reasons, and it's, it's not really important uh, from my standpoint why they're used, just to kind of know that some of these have an inner cannula, some don't. You're going to have to look at the thing and be sure. There's a bunch, that, uh, a bunch of styles that don't look like any of these uh, that may be totally different as well. So good sources of information on what this thing is supposed to do would be the family or the patient, uh, or sometimes they might have an information sheet with them. Uh, and sometimes you're just not going to know, uh, but going to have to take your best, uh, best shot at it. Here's some of those things again, just to give you an idea of what they're used for. Uh, a cuff tracheostomy tube, if the cuff is up, is generally used to provide positive pressure or keep secretions out of the uh, uh, lower airways. So the cuff acts just like a tracheostomy, or a um, uh, ET tube, um, and then your airflow comes from the tracheostomy tube down through uh, into the trachea itself. Now, of note, when the cuff's up, the idea is that nothing else passes through the trachea. So if the cuff is up, you can't get air from the upper airway down uh, into the trachea for the most part. That's the design of it. The uncuffed tube or a a uh, cuff tube with a cuff deflated uh, does allow some oxygen to pass and some gases to pass next to the tube itself, um, but with the same general considerations as the other one. Uh, a fenestrated tube has a hole cut in sort of the elbow so that more gas can pass from the upper airways down into the lower airways. So this might be useful for somebody that uh, is maybe getting ready to have their tube removed or doesn't need a whole lot of uh, uh, support otherwise, and the idea is mostly to get most to their air uh, and gas exchange through the upper airway um, with a little bit of supplementation as needed through the tracheostomy itself. It's just kind of an idea of what's going on um, for reference. But here's your typical tracheostomy setup. Uh, it's going to have an outer cannula, maybe with a cuff on it, maybe with not. Um, it's going to have an inner cannula that can be removed and honestly thrown away uh, if you had to. Uh, and then it usually comes with this obturator thing. Uh, and this is just to keep uh, make it easier to insert the thing. You can't actually breathe with this thing in place. So that's what a standard tracheostomy tube looks like. And of, of course, here's the hub that ties it down and the pilot balloon, uh, which you'd be able to figure out, of course.
So we go back to the question, now that we know what the thing kind of looks like, uh, if the patient's in distress, we put oxygen on them, they're not a whole lot better. Now our question is, is this tube patent? So uh, how, do we, how do we address that? What's our first step? You can kind of take this algorithmically. First question in is the tube patient is, is there anything stuck on top of it? So this is a cap over top of the end of the tracheostomy tube. If a well-meaning family member were to cap off your tracheostomy tube for whatever reason, um, and you required it, then you couldn't breathe through it because it's a solid cap on there. There's some other things that end up on the end of, uh, of these tubes. Uh, sometimes they get occluded, sometimes they get malpositioned, um, but you gotta get them off if you're gonna assess patency of the tube. Uh, this thing on the um, <clears throat> left-hand side is a uh, heat and moisture exchanger, just makes it uh, easier to breathe. The thing in the middle is a speaking valve, and then the thing on the end is, uh, again, a, a cap, just a, a, a thing to block the tube itself. We want to make sure that the tube itself is clear. So when you, you can't have the tube clear with one of these sitting on the end of it, uh, so you got to remove those before you can say that, yes, the tube is clear. After that, uh, you look at the inner cannula itself. So the inner cannula is this piece here. It's held on by a couple of wings usually, and you can slide that guy out. And the patient still has a tracheostomy in place. It still has a tube in place, uh, but now this thing in the middle is out. And the idea behind this thing is to give you something so that you can pull it out. You can clean out the inside of this thing and still have a functioning tracheostomy in place. Uh, and then once it's clean, uh, you know, if it's not disposable, um, you can slide it back in or you can replace it with a different one if, it's, uh, if it is a disposable one. Um, but the inner cannula also has to come out. So, again, how are we going to make sure the tube is patent? We are going to remove all the caps and stuff off the end of it, and then we'll just pull out the inner tube. Um, and you will usually find that this is probably the culprit. It's gotten gummed up with uh, secretions or dried mucus or something like that, and it's usually pretty gross. If you have a little brush, you can actually clean that thing out. Um, <clears throat> but if it's disposable, then you just toss it away and you get a, get a new one. Um, so at that point, we have the uh, tracheostomy itself open, or at least we think it's open. Um, we've cleared out everything that we can see externally. Now, how do we know that it's actually patent? Because that's the whole question is, is this tube patent? Uh, if it's patent, we should be able to exchange gas. Something else is going on if, if it's patent and the patient's still not doing well. In order to check and see if this is patent, the easiest way is to see if a suction catheter goes down it. So you probably have a suction catheter available or a family has a suction catheter available. I've again removed the inner cannula. I've uh, <clears throat> um, taken all the caps and all the appliances and stuff off the end of it. And I'm going to see if I can uh, put a suction catheter down there. So if you can pass a catheter down through the tube itself, and this is the, if you can't remember what size catheter to use, use about one, one and a half times the uh, size of the tube itself. Um, <clears throat> But uh, if you can pass a catheter through the tracheostomy tube, uh, you've proved it's patent. While you're down there, you should go ahead and suction stuff out and use your you know, good technique as best you can. Let's say that you try to pass a suction catheter, though, and you meet resistance. It doesn't go down. Probably one of two things is happening. Uh, one could be that there is so much gunk in there that you're uh, unable to get the catheter down past it. Hopefully you'll be able to suction that out, but if not, we're just going to have to get rid of this thing in a second. Uh, thing that thing that could happen number two is that the uh, the tracheal tube may have migrated so uh, at that point if you can't pass a catheter uh, even despite suctioning next step would be to uh, deflate the cuff on the end of this thing now most people are not going to go home with a cuff tube in place or at least with the cuff up on the tube uh, typically speaking a, a cuff tracheal tube is for providing positive pressure uh, or maybe if they've got terrible secretion problems you might put it in there but most people won't go home with a, uh, a cuff tracheal tube inflated if it is up though you would go ahead now some people may somebody may have put it up in the meantime but uh, <clears throat> if they uh, do have an inflated cuff then go ahead and deflate it at this point what might have happened the reason you're doing that uh, is what might have happened is the tracheostomy tube itself may have gotten sort of pulled out a little bit and when it gets pulled out uh, because or falls out a little bit because it's been sitting for a while um, <clears throat> it can sometimes wedge itself up against the back of the uh, trachea uh, and be held there by the balloon. The idea is if you, decre if you deflate the balloon, if you deflate the uh, cuff, uh, 
then you not only allow some air to pass around it, uh, hopefully, uh, but you also allow that thing to move a little bit more freely and that may migrate back down into the trachea a little bit. So deflate the cuff, see if you have any improvement with that. If you've not been able to improve anything at this point, we have uh, first taken all the stuff off the apply or all the little appliances and buttons and doodads off the end of the thing. We have uh, passed or we've removed the um, inner cannula. We've tried to put a tube down, uh, a suction catheter down through the tracheal tube itself. Nothing's worked. At this point, we're just going to go ahead and DC the tube. Now, you may get a little nervous about this, like, I don't want to pull this thing out. Somebody told me this, the, the stoma will close back up, and then we won't have an airway, and then they'll have to go and make another one, and, and I'll get in trouble. But if the patient's in distress and you haven't been able to clear the tube otherwise, uh, then leaving that non-functioning tube in place doesn't help anybody. So... Go ahead and take that out, undo the ties. Um, <clears throat> even if the thing was placed yesterday, if you can't pass a catheter through it and you can't fix it otherwise, uh, then that thing can come out. So the balloon's down, uh, we've got the tube out, and we're left with a stoma at this point. Um, <clears throat> What do you do with that thing? Well, you can try to suction through it, uh, but usually uh, this will this will sort of fix the problem. Whatever was wrong with the tube itself, uh, we've now gotten rid of the tube, and so you've hopefully got a patent connection between the air and the trachea. What do you do at that point? Well, if the patient's better and they have another trach tube, you could replace it uh, and try to put it in place or help the family, depending on your scope of practice. Most of the time it will fit. Usually the family has one of a smaller size floating around in case it does not fit very easily. Um, <clears throat> if they do trach changes at home, the family is likely to be very comfortable doing this and maybe they just needed somebody to tell them to do it. Uh, but once you have the uh, uh, tube out, you can try to replace it, uh, or you can, if there's really, you know, no, if they don't have another one, or if the patient's not in distress, you could take them to the hospital just like this, provided they're breathing okay. Um, they don't have to have the tube in place for the, you know, five or ten minute transport that it's going to take to get you there. Again, the enemy of good is perfect. If we fix it just by pulling the thing out and we don't want to monkey around with it anymore, that's reasonable. We'll, fi we'll figure out something when they get to the hospital. So to recap a little bit where we're at, um, you roll up on a patient who's in respiratory distress and has a tracheostomy. You put oxygen on them, both on their face and on their stoma. You remove the inner cannula and all the little appliances on the tube itself to ensure that the tube, uh, the uh, outer cannula of the tracheostomy looks patent. Um, we couldn't pass the suction catheter down there. We deflated the balloon, and uh, then when we still didn't get any better response, we removed the tracheostomy tube. And yet the patient is still in distress, still has a low end tidal CO2, uh, and still is hypoxic and looks like they're about to die. What do you do at that point? But you still have at this point a patent, uh, theoretically a patent hole right here which should be able to access the trachea. Uh, and you also have the upper airway uh, that you could use to access the trachea sort of indirectly or at least via the pharynx. So uh, one of the things you might try is you've done a lot of work on the trachea thus far. Try ventilating from above. How do you do that? Well, get your standard BVM. Um, <clears throat> put it on the face and use it like anybody else. Again, most people with a tracheostomy itself that didn't have a laryngectomy uh, will still have some degree of patent airway uh, above it. Not everybody, but it's worth a shot. Um, <clears throat> and if you're able to ventilate that way, you may have to, by the way, you may have to put a finger over the tracheostomy if you're, you know, squeeze the bag and air just comes rushing out here. You may need to occlude the tracheostomy itself. Um, but if you uh, do so and you can ventilate that way, then that'll work. Uh, and a lot of times it, it will work. You do probably need to have a good two-handed seal and, again, a partner to sort of hold something over top of that to uh, occlude the stoma itself. Um, by the way, when you put that thing on, you have to have end title on the end of it. Every airway, every time, every tube, every mask that you put on somebody's face uh, needs to have end title CO2 to confirm that you are, uh, in fact, exchanging gas and that everything's uh, going the way that it should and that either the tube or the mask is getting a good seal and you're in the right spot. So if you can't ventilate from above, you can try ventilating the stoma itself. Um, you can do that with a small, like a pediatric size mask. This is uh, not the little baby mask, but the one kind of right above it. That actually would fit pretty well on an adult size stoma. Uh, 
mostly you just need some sort of small mask that'll let you get a little bit of a seal uh, around the uh, stoma itself. And pretty much anything will work in that situation. If you have end tidal on the end of it and you're exchanging gas and you're getting a waveform back, it doesn't matter what it looks like as long as it's functional. If you haven't been able to fix it by either ventilating above or from uh, the stoma itself, you can intubate the stoma. Um, <clears throat> now, most of these aren't huge, but they will accommodate, you know, a standard size ET tube. Generally speaking, though, you'll probably be able to just pass a uh, small ET tube down through the stoma. And again, we're talking about like a 6.5 tube or something like that should be no problem for most tracheostomies. Um, <clears throat> and if you had to go a little on the smaller side, okay, it'll work for right now. Again, enemy of good is perfect. Let's get something in place right now and we'll worry about how well it looks later. You're not going to want to bury this thing. Uh, you really just want just the balloon inside the trachea itself, uh, which is actually going to put the tip pretty much at the carina when you look at where most tracheostomies are. So, by the way, you can also cut if you got that big dangly piece on the end of it. Instead of having you know 20 centimeters of tube, uh, you can cut it off above where the pilot balloon comes off and pop that thing off and uh, stick the hub back down on top of it. So we've tried to intubate the stoma and say that we've been unable to do that for whatever reason. You can try to intubate from above. Now, knowing that uh, there is probably a connection between the oropharynx and the trachea, uh, that may work. You're probably going to have to put, you're going to have to make sure that you push the balloon past where the tracheostomy uh, stoma is. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to blow air out the tracheostomy stoma, but um, that should theoretically work. You probably still do have a connection up there. Um, unfortunately, that may be a very difficult intubation. <clears throat> There's probably some reason that the patient had the tracheostomy in the, to start with, uh, but sometimes these actually don't work out so bad, um, and you're, you're able to get the uh, tube without a whole lot of problems. This again sort of falls behind. Let's put a whole, let's put another tube in the stoma uh, because it's probably more difficult, but not impossible. Uh, and if that's all you've got, then that's all you've got, and it's worth a shot. So this is all assuming, of course, that the patient has a connection between their uh, oropharynx and uh, their trachea, that they have not had a laryngectomy. They've just got a tracheostomy for whatever reason. If they've had a laryngectomy, things are a little bit different. But we'll talk about that in the next video.